I would like to then turn to our panel on the consumer power of Asia's uh, middle class. And we have uh, three uh, distinguished uh, uh, business leaders uh, who come from different parts of the economy. And so uh, our panel will give us a panoramic view of all of the different uh, uh, you know, areas of the economy where the rise of the middle class consumer is being felt. I'll introduce each of them and then ask them the, uh, the first round of questions. Uh, so Mr. Sufa Chai is the president and CEO of True Corporation Public Company Limited, which is the largest telecommunications company in Thailand. Uh, and uh, it is one of the uh, leading companies in its sector in Asia. He joined the company in 1992 as a vice president. And uh, he's uh, someone who is very active uh, in corporate social responsibility. Uh, so you have uh, helped provide uh, technology for over 5,000 schools in Thailand. And uh, you have also uh, launched programs to help uh, the hearing and the visually uh, impaired. Uh, and uh, you have a, a BA from uh, Boston University, right? Yes. Uh, so the first question uh, for you uh, that I would like to uh, formulate here is, how do you see this tremendous growth in middle class uh, consumption and purchasing power affecting an industry uh, that is as important to the economy these days as telecommunications? Thank you, Ian. Uh, I have to correct one thing. We are the, not the largest uh, telecommunication in Thailand, <laughs> but the second. Okay. The, the second. statistics, right? <laughs> you know what yes. uh, happens. Really? <laughs> but yes, in, in the broadband area, we are, we are the uh, number one. Um, how we see the, the middle class uh, emerging in Thailand, we, we can actually uh, look at the, um, the broadband penetration in Thailand. Uh, the broadband penetrations uh, to the Thailand household, for example, now there are about 20 million households in Thailand. And uh, the broadband penetration is now about 5 million, which is the wide line uh, broadband penetrations. But in the past couple of years, um, the, the, the 3G, and now it's coming into the 4G age, have increased the number of the broadband penetrations to close to 50%. And that is, you know, in couple with the, the low, low cost smart devices that are coming into Thailand. So, you know, in terms of the, the household's um, uh, income, we have about uh, 5 million households which have the income over uh, 15,000 baht. And that is roughly about uh, 500 uh, US dollars. So um, per, this is per month. And if you consider the middle class to be uh, above, uh, say, 10,000 baht, which is again around 10, 12 US dollars per day kind of income level, yeah. then you're talking about uh, close to 10 million households in Thailand. So um, we can also see very clearly the, the urbanizations that are happening. Uh, throughout the country. Our broadband, uh, the, the fixed line or the, the wide line broadband penetration and growth in Bangkok is close to 10% a year. And it has been con very consistent uh, in the past three years. But the, the upcountry broadband uh, penetration and growth have been over 20% a year. And this, again, uh, is a key indication where we see that uh, there's a lot of constructions, a lot of people moving into the cities. Uh, I approve by myself uh, all these housing estates uh, projects, you know, of hundreds of projects, uh, you know, per week. So this is, uh, you know, especially for the upcountry. So we can see that people are now, you know, wanting, wanted to have a lifestyle which is Certainly, uh, 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 with the inference of the medias, with the inference of uh, and the, and the conveniences that are happening, uh, people are moving into the cities. You know, from the agro-based uh, country like ourselves, you can see that migration, even be, you know, as, as a telecommunication company. Um, beyond that, uh, with the government policies in uh, making this investment in, in the infrastructure, especially in the mass transit, which will be uh, we're building this high-speed train and super high-speed train across the country. Um, and the economics policy on the economic zoning, especially uh, in the, the zone where we have uh, the trade with our neighbors, countries. This also will fuel the, uh, the increase in urbanizations and uh, the redistributions of in incomes moving from the, the coastline, you know, up 
you know, in the, the north and the northeast area, which again have majorities of the population in Thailand. So it is, it is very clear to us uh, in, the, in the area of e-commerce, we also see uh, a more than 25% growth uh, annually. So we are still very far from the developed country. I think the developed country e-commerce trade uh, compared to the uh, retail commerce is about 7 to 10%. In Thailand right now, we are about 0.5%, but the growth is rapid. So I think we are approaching the turning point because of the broadband penetration, because of the, the devices, the smart devices that allow people to actually access uh, you know, broad, mobile broadband and internet. This is actually uh, shaping the country. I think we are we're looking at Thailand, which I, I could say that is represented a big part of uh, the, the ASEAN communities. Mm -hmm. um, you're seeing that the, 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 it's coming to the end of the, the ignorant kind of age. People are not living by themselves, you know, in the, in the sub-regions areas. So people are now going into this so-called the, the connected world. And it's, it will not happen it's in the past uh, where, where the 3G technology, the 4G technology, and especially the, the smart devices and uh, price that have been coming down uh, significantly in the past, uh, I would say, only two years. Now imagine uh, if, if, you, if we say that uh, the large countries uh, in the past would take, uh, say, 20 to 30 years, some countries take 50 years uh, to, to double their GDPs, okay? Now the, the countries uh, nowadays could double their GDPs uh, much faster. And, and that's you know, thanks to the, the global trade, the openness, and also to the, the communications uh, technology and how is the, the, the digital economy uh, have more or less uh, transforming uh, the emerging market. So this is, again, another government policy uh, thanks to uh, our Prime Minister, our Deputy Prime Minister, um, you know, Momo Bria Tont, who actually are pushing forward uh, this policy on the digital economy. And I believe this would become uh, uh, the regional agenda, not only for the case of Thailand. Now, b before we are living in, in the islands, even though we have the trade and in encouraging the free trade, but the, the so-called the uh, competitiveness KPIs for the country is not really opened. Until now that we, we are now in the, economics, uh, the same economic zone, we start to compare notes. And I believe that will actually help accelerate it, the investment in the area of the infrastructure going forward and will help accelerate the, the, the transformation of the middle class. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Supachai. Uh, our second uh, panelist uh, is uh, Mr. Khan, um, who is the president and CEO of uh, Siam Cement Group, SCG. And uh, congratulations to you for your recent uh, 100th uh, anniversary. Okay. Uh, this is, a, uh, as uh, most of you know, a, a very large and diversified industrial group. has a presence in cement, chemicals, paper, metals, and also in the form of joint ventures um, in the automobile industry. Uh, Mr. Khan uh, was trained as an engineer here in Thailand, and then he uh, received uh, a master's degree from Georgia Institute of Technology and uh, he is uh, engaged with uh, several business associations here in Asia. So uh, we just saw how uh, the telecommunications sector is essentially riding this wave of uh, economic and uh, social transformation in the region and uh, essentially providing the foundations for the growth of the uh, middle class consumer market. So from your perspective, as a company that is very deeply engaged in the physical infrastructure, providing the materials for the physical infrastructure, mm, sure. How do you see this trend in Thailand and in the other countries in the region where you operate? Oh, yes. <clears throat> Thank you. First of all, I have to, to say sorry about my voice, okay? In the past uh, two days, uh, I spoke a lot, okay? Uh, I joined the CLSA forum. It's a must, okay, to welcome all the investors to Thailand, okay? And also, I have to thank uh, uh, Walton to arrange this forum in Thailand. We need you by this time, okay? Thank you very much. So, okay, for the questions, I'd like to start with uh, some figures, okay? Also some statistics, right? Uh, 
globally for the, the uh, infrastructure stock, okay, roughly about 71% of the GDP is for global standard. But in, in uh, most of the ASEAN countries, including Thailand, uh, the infrastructure stock represents just only about 49%. Okay. Number one, of course, is uh, Singapore. Okay. Thailand is roughly about uh, 51. Okay. So what I mean okay, for the infra infrastructure stock? Uh, transportation, of course. Okay. Telecommunication. Okay. Then uh, power. And then finally water. Okay. And then if you look into the the also the, the housing, okay, the quality of housing in in the region. I would say uh, most of the houses okay in ASEAN uh, for many many countries uh, are substandard. Okay, my figure was in two thousand nine, Laos, Cambodia, about eighty percent of the houses under standard. Philippines forty one percent. Vietnam 35, Thailand 28. Okay, I'm not I'm not talking about uh, uh, <clears throat> our modular house. Okay, that in market today, the SCG ham. Okay, that, that is, is a high end house. Okay, but this is a normal uh, standard house. Another important figure to all of us here, especially a much more PDR thought the government. I've seen in the past uh, 10 years, during 1992 to 2011, spent, okay, the, the historical spending. For example, in Thailand, we spent about 8.6 billion a year annually. In order to reach the level of the standard of the Western world, we need to spend about 25 billion a year, a year, okay? So this means we have to need, we need to, to increase the infrastructure spend about three times to reach that level. In case of Indonesia, about five to six times of the historical spending, uh, same way as uh, in the Philippines. So, okay, all in total, I believe that infrastructure is the key okay, for this uh, middle income uh, growth, okay, and consumer demand in this region. Talking about inf uh, infrastructure, very important to Thailand today about the transportation. I travel a lot in the region, and also SEG invested a lot in the region. We are having uh, four cement projects in four countries. Okay, in Indonesia, in Myanmar, in uh, Cambodia, and Laos. All the cement uh, consumption grows. Okay, demand grows. In Myanmar and Cambodian market, okay, in Cambodia, the growth was about 10%, 10-11% in the past few years. Okay. Cambodian market also very, very good to us. Okay. For the transportation, is really, really needed. Right now, we can see that okay, because of urbanization, everybody wants automobiles, okay, cars. We are so happy that we have a joint venture with uh, uh, Toyota in Thailand. We have 10% in Toyota Thailand. We receive a very, very good dividends from them in the past five, six years in a row, okay? But maybe this year a, a bit drop, okay, because the automobile sale in Thailand dropped a little bit. But for the mass transit is, is very essential. That's why, okay, we, we expand a lot into ASEAN today. The traffic gonna be very bad. Okay, in Bangkok, you have seen already the traffic. Today might might be a bit light. Okay, okay. I went to Jakarta many times. I would say Jakarta might be the worst in traffic jam today. Every time I have a, a business trip to Jakarta, my last trip was to see the industry, industry minister. The meeting at seven o'clock. 7 p.m. I arrive at around 5. How could I reach to the hotel, okay, to the meeting room? I used the service of the, you know, police, police motorbike. Only one police, okay, unbelievable. 
they can guide the traffic, you know. Gradually, you get smoothly, so I could reach. So I tell you all the executive, if you have a business trip in Jakarta, you know, you can contact SEG for this, <laughs> this phone number, very important phone number, okay? <laughs> and the service is so smooth, okay? So all in all, you know, it's, it's, it's really booming in, in, in Asia, in ASEAN. And also, I give you another the figures. All together in ASEAN, in ASEAN uh, in the next just 10 years, we will double the number of the middle income class, okay? And of course, we are growing old. I think for this round, I just want to say that for Thailand in particular, we need to leave the state of the middle income trap before we are getting old. I don't want to be poor and old. <laughs> it's, it's very suffering, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Khan. Uh, our third panelist is um, uh, Mr. Froley, Bertrand Froley. Uh, he uh, started his career at uh, Michelin uh, and then uh, continued uh, on the McKinsey, uh, working in consumer-oriented uh, industries. And then more recently, uh, he was uh, running businesses for uh, L'Oréal. Uh, and uh, he's at the present time an independent uh, consultant and advisor to, uh, to companies. Um, he's a Frenchman. Uh, he graduated from uh, HSC. Uh, one of the uh, leading business schools in, in France, one of the uh, uh, elite schools. And then he uh, came to the Wharton School to get his MBA and also to get a Master of Arts in International Studies from the Lauder Institute. Uh, uh, so um, your experience, or most of your experience, is with um, non-durable consumer goods, and in some cases, luxury goods. Uh, so uh, you're, and you're familiar with this part of the world, with the Asia-Pacific region. What do you see as the key trends in terms of uh, non-durables? and the emerging uh, middle class. Thank you, Mauro. Uh, just maybe before I answer, uh, the sheer numbers, because everyone is uh, quoting numbers, <laughs> uh, but the sheer numbers are mind-boggling, and it's just an anecdote, because I have a classmate uh, from uh, Lauder, Ilan Cohen, and I was in, uh, in China, first visiting China with my wife, I mean, my fiancé at the time, uh, 1990, and uh, so Ilan was taking us to the Great Wall, you know, China, we were in a taxi, and the taxi driver asked him in Chinese, and he doesn't speak Chinese because it was the Lauder Institute, and, and um, you know, how many people live in France? So I, at the time, with 1990, was roughly 55 million. So I answered 55 million, and the guy, the taxi driver, started laughing, you know, really. I thought, okay, what's so funny, you know? <laughs> and he said, you know, people with my name, and he, he was called Zhang, Z-H-A-N-G, which is a common name, there are 100 million, over 100 million of Zhang. <laughs> so twice as much as French people. <laughs> I started to relate to the number that this is a different uh, continent, a different world. Um, so just to come back to your, to your question, I think uh, as you were saying, I mean, as you were showing in your numbers, I mean, the, you know, the disposable income, basically. People, basically, if we classify between people who earn less than $10 a day versus people who earn more, I mean, roughly now we have two uh, billion people with less than ten dollars a day, and four billion, which are middle class and over four billion. And this will, the the the, below, the middle class will uh, basically double from two to four, uh, whereas the and for the first time, as you said, in 2020, will be more people from the middle class as poor people. Uh, and it, of course, for consumer goods companies, you know, whatever the industry, this is a huge opportunity for uh, for growth. Usually you look at the kind of the unique cost, um, you know, so in the curve, let's say people would start with the least costly items of so snacks and beverages, then they would move to products like uh, beauty products, you know, here in, in uh, Thailand or in Asia, whitening products are very popular, for example. Then you would move to the kind of luxury goods items, I mean, fashion and accessories, uh, and then eventually you move to services. That's the typical curve, usually a bit of an S-curve uh, going on. Um, more and more what you see is, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Supachai is selling phones also and, and, and uh, services related to phones. I mean, probably for companies like L'Oréal, where I used to work for 20 years, you know, uh, 
our biggest competitor is not, uh, was not uh, Procter & Gamble or Unilever, it was probably the phone companies because people <laughs> you know, with disposable <laughs> income, what do they do? Do, do they yeah. either buy a new, uh, some, the latest Samsung uh, mm -hmm. S5 or S6 uh, or the latest Apple? Or do they buy another product from Lancome, from Giorgio Armani, from and so on? Uh, and same thing when you relate, I mean, it, it's a more complex world, you know, Toyota cars, I mean, people, you know, okay, this is a significant investment, okay, of course, you take some debt. Uh, here in Thailand, you have quite a, a big uh, a private debt uh, uh, to finance, for example, cars and homes. So it's a very complex world where you've got to earn your share, basically, of this disposable income. Um, so regarding consumer goods, uh, maybe to narrow it down to, to uh, my area, consumer goods, non durable consumer goods, um, Clearly, what you've seen is that international companies obviously you know, see that today roughly 20, 25%, 30% of their income comes from emerging countries, and then in 15 years from now, it will be the reverse. I mean, you know, from, uh, they will derive only 30% from developed countries, or so-called developed countries, and uh, two-thirds will come from emerging countries. So this is a total paradigm shift, really a tipping point, and that requires uh, very different ways of uh, thinking. You know, uh, so you, of course, you need resources. I mean, you, so we need to hire lots of Indians and Thais and uh, Chinese to basically uh, feed that growth. You need to organize differently because instead of having a model where you used to invent centrally, you know, uh, in Paris or in New York and then push it down to the markets, basically you need now to have hubs, regional hubs that can identify the local consumer needs and come with uh, propositions, what we've called you know, at L'Oreal, uh, we have a few examples, what we call reverse engineering of products invented in emerging markets that then make it very successfully in the home markets. Uh, you can talk about a phenomenon which came from South Korea called the BB cream, you know, uh, which was a kind of a transition between makeup and skincare, mm -hmm. a blend of uh, those two categories that has become an extremely uh, important trend uh, in, uh, in Europe and the US, so all over the world. You can, call, you can talk about the uh, you know, uh, an invention on, on El Sev, which was a shampoo for a very damaged hair, Total Repair 5, that was invented in Brazil, is now the second franchise worldwide for L'Oreal. You can talk about Unilever, uh, you know, the, uh, or the sachet that, that they have developed in, in, the, in, the, in India in, uh, to, uh, to go to the upcountry and to the rural areas, uh, which uh, now I use. Um, so this kind of what we could say a bit jugad innovation, you know, smart, low-cost innovation. Uh, you know, some example uh, are the fridge without electricity from Mitikul and so on. They're now making it back, which is very interesting in home markets, because uh, unless what we've seen on your numbers, in France, for example, you see more and more poor people. And uh, Vianney Muliez, who is uh, the, the CEO for Auchan, one of the retailers in, uh, in France, uh, like the of Tesco and Carrefour, he said that we have to identify in France the emerging markets, meaning people who are poor and who cannot afford, you know, the, the goods that they used to be able to afford because they're getting poor. So there is a, it's a complex world where you've got to manage, you know, this growing middle class in Asia, the poor middle class in, uh, or less and less middle class, but more poor in, in Europe, and how to basically optimize this through uh, um, reorganization, basically. Okay, thank you very much. There's a variation on that joke in Europe, as you know, uh, which is that uh, you know somebody from a small European country arrives in China and says, uh, "We're seven million people," and then the taxi driver asks, "At which hotel are you staying?" Right. <laughs> uh -huh. So, the, um, Mr. Sufatirai, um, what do you think are going to be the uh, winning online strategies uh, for companies that want to capitalize? on this massive growth of uh, middle-class consumption, uh, especially here in, um, in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, you're a provider of those services, right, to companies and to households in terms of internet access and so on and so forth. But where do you see online strategies going? Where are going to be the winning online strategies for companies that want to use your infrastructure to reach the uh, new global middle-class consumer? Thank you for the questions. Um, I, I do not claim that I, I exactly know that. Um, you know, maybe this is just one of my, my answer. Uh, I think as we, we all understand that the people who actually are shaping the market, uh, the Gen Y, uh, this is, these are the, the people aged from say 14 to 35. And we know that uh, this, 
these um, generations, they are just, um, they have these access availabilities uh, through the internet, through mobile, through broadband. And uh, their world is very different from, from where, you know, we are. I'll take, for example, my, my son. Um, uh, you know, where, where, when I was his age, like 10 years old, I'm still playing jump rope, okay? But uh, my son is playing this uh, online game, you know, and when I try to involve with him and play with him, you know, he would say, Daddy, you are a noob. A noob means the, the amateur. <laughs> and uh, in Thai, it's called uh, cha la mai lu leung. So you are slow and you, you don't know things. So I have to teach you, okay? And, and these this generations, uh, they also challenge you. Uh, in, in my generation, for example, it's a one-way communication. Uh, you know, parents know more than you, so you have to lis listen to the parents. Now, no, for these generations, even the 10 years old boy, uh, they, would, they would challenge you and say that they learned this from YouTube. How you argue with it? <laughs> okay, and uh, this is how many likes and this is how many don't like. You know, uh, how can you argue with that? This the majority, what, what majority are saying? Okay, uh, just recently he uploaded uh, his uh, criticisms on uh, online, one of the online games uh, to the YouTube. And you know what? Uh, his viewers exceed all of my YouTube uploads combined together. <laughs> I think it's uh, over 700,000 views now. So, so you are seeing that uh, you, you're looking forward 10, 15 years from now and uh, the behavior of the market will be shaped and will be changed. The mobile commerce will, will take place. The mobile culture will take place. This is not, uh, you see that the, the consumer market always move much faster than the corporate. So the corporate will have to also change itself, moving itself into the mobile culture. Mm -hmm. Because uh, in many countries that you can see, including in these regions, um, we already have the mobile commerce exceed the online commerce, even in Thailand. So before, you can be a number one in the online or in the traditional media world in doing commerce. But now, if you don't jump into the, the mobile commerce, then you have problem. The, from number one, you can turn into what, number 10, okay? So um, this is where we need to change and the, 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 the way they consume the media is also change. How you build the brand will have to be relevant and will have to focus on the right community, okay? Um, and this is what is shaping the world, the Gen Y is changing, changing the behavior and how they perceive the brand. But again, it's, uh, I would say that uh, but still the, the memory of the big brand is still very important. The memory of the people can only remember up to two top brand, uh, three, two to three top, top brands. But um, this is uh, again another, another issues that uh, for, for the, the countries in these regions, including China, in how to build brand. So uh, we always look up to the foreign brand. So there's a lot of opportunities for the foreign investment and the foreign brand to establish themselves over this transformation period uh, of this emerging middle class market. Um, and I, I cannot explain that uh, the, the way I see it is, is coming so fast. Um, in, 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 in this rapid change. Even my mother, she is now 74, and she is now uh, texting lines and sending me stickers. <laughs> okay, so um, with these availabilities of both devices and access, uh, it's just changing the, the, the way people are consuming and people are, uh, are you know, realizing the media or using the media to establish brand. So what I, can, what I can, can say is that Gen Y will be key and they have the they inference, okay? They inference the, the rest of the generations as well. And they actually shaped it, the, the new products and services 
So if uh, you wanted uh, to do that, is, is this relevant even for ASEAN regions? Because uh, uh, if you look at, um, for example, take uh, true cooperation itself, uh, we plan to uh, um, overlay fiber to home network in Bangkok and greater Bangkok area, which cover about 4.5 million households or um, 15 million populations in, in Bangkok and greater Bangkok area. And this, this, this plan is actually to invest at uh, following again the national uh, economics, uh, digital economic policies is to, to be uh, completed at the end of next year. So you, we are moving from the copper broadband into the optic fiber to home broadband. That, that would change many things, the home entertainment, the uh, internet of all things, like the, uh, the machine to machines. You're, you're, going to, you're talking about smart home, you're talking about smart transportation, you're talking about smart office, and then you're talking about smart cities. And, and this will happen within the next two to three years, not very distant away. You talk about uh, one of the, the largest capitals in these regions. And I believe the other uh, capitals will be, will be doing the same thing. For the upcountry, just for TrueCorp itself, we are investing another uh, four to five million households fiber to home. It will make the, the upcountry's um, home pass with the ability to access a high-speed broadband internet up to about six, six million just for TrueCorp itself. Just for true cooperation, we will probably by the end of next year cover 10 million households out of 20 million. So the penetration are going very fast. This is not counting the 4G. By second half of this year, the 4G handset will be lower than 100 US dollars. We, we could expect to see a 60 US dollars 4G handset. Okay. So the 4G itself will also enhance uh, the broadband communications. And this access, this sharing of knowledge and behaviors and how, how what do you call it, the, the, the geo economy and the geo media. Now the, the, the company will have to change their media strategy uh, in the next two or three years of how they're reaching all this, uh, the middle class and the, the, the generation Y, for example. This would be my, my comment at this thank point. You, thank, thank you, thank uh, you. Mr. Khan, earlier you uh, talked uh, vividly about the transportation infrastructure. Uh, could you uh, share with us your thoughts about uh, how uh, the real estate sector, uh, so both uh, residential and commercial, may be changing as a result of these uh, trends? Uh, <clears throat> we have seen a lot of good development in Thailand, for example. Uh, of course, the organization, okay, uh, we have a growing bigger and bigger city. But you see, uh, th there's a, an interesting uh, data about cement demand. In the old days, in the past uh, 30, 40 years, cement demand and concrete demand in Bangkok and vicinity, roughly about 50%, okay, and outside uh, Bangkok, about another 50%. But in the past two years, Cement consumption outside Bangkok represents about 75%. So this is a big change. So this means it's growing, okay? And also, we have, we're gonna have a big and bigger cities outside Bangkok, okay? Like Chiang Mai, Udon Thani. If you go to Udon Thani, you, you might see a lot of foreigners over there, okay? Uh, especially from, from Europe, married to the Thai ladies, okay? And the house quality also very good. You know, our ceramic tiles, especially the one designed and manufactured in Italy, so very well in those areas. And also to Pattaya area, for example, this is changed, okay? So it means that, okay, the, 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 the landscape gonna be changed, okay? So not only in Thailand, we see uh, in Indonesia, Right now, not only in Jakarta, but Surabaya also going very, very fast, very quickly. Medan area also going quickly, okay. I just been to Simriap, okay. So not only uh, Phnom Penh, but other uh, city like uh, Simriap, a lot of tourists, okay, for, for the Angkor Wat. So before you die, please visit Angkor Wat. 
they, they say it, okay? They say it like that, right? So I agree them, that's why I be sick, okay? And, and then a lot of uh, 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 construction for the high-rise building, for the urbanization. You know, we, we built a, a new building, SEG 100 years, okay, building, uh, 20, 21 floors, okay? We locate up north of Bangkok, okay, in Bangsu area, gonna be the big, okay, uh, train station, the biggest one in Thailand. So on the top, you know, floor, if you look back to the city, it's a panoramic view, very beautiful, okay? Because if you stay in the downtown, you, you see just a tall building around you, but away, about 10, 15 kilometers away, beautiful. So you see, the, by that area, a lot of construction for the subway. Okay, we have, currently in Thailand, we have four subway lines under construction. And the government trying their best to speed up all this construction, okay? So in my area, Bangsu area, a lot of new condominium coming up. So, so you can see that a lot of the demand, okay? And also, uh, this is good to our, our employees as well. We have uh, about 7,000 employees in our complex, okay? So the new condominium, roughly about 20% of the occupation, you know, of the customers from our company employees in those areas, all right? So I'd like to end my, my comments on that. This is growing, okay? So uh, middle class uh, consumer is very important, okay? Before my, my ending, I'd like to have some comment on uh, Bertrand, okay? You just mentioned that, okay? Uh, you know, I just realized that Okay, our, com our company, okay, we have uh, three core business. Uh, chemical, okay, which is mainly B2B. Paper, also a lot of B B2B, some small portion of B2C. And uh, cement building materials, okay, some portion of B2C. Just, okay, and growing very, very quickly. I just learned that I have to compete with Kun Chai. Really. And you know, two years ago, two and a half years ago, when the government announced the first car policy, okay, my marketing and sales manager came to, to me that, oh my God, our sales revenue projection for the building material will drop. I didn't believe him at that time. And later on, really dropped, you know, because all the households spend all their savings to buy cars. They have no money to repair their house. They wait for a year, and now they wait for two years already, you know? So we need the government spending to help us now, please. <laughs> <laughs> please disburse all the, your investment, everything, okay, spending. Okay, I'd like to end my, my comments. Thank you. I will be happy to. <laughs> I will be happy to advise you on the consumer goods if you want. <laughs> so, Mr. Frawley, um, uh, there's a number of issues that have come up uh, that I think are very central to uh, consumer non durables, uh, uh, such as branding strategies and uh, the younger generation of consumers. Uh, so, how do you think those uh, factors will need to, well, companies, how, how, how should they think about branding and uh, approaching the uh, you know, millennial generation, the young consumer? Uh, in order to be successful in the industries in which uh, you know you you have experience, a um, couple of comments. One is, for example, for L'Oréal, which is a 25 billion euro company, so we, you know number one in cosmetics. We think that we were addressing, and I still say we, but we, you know, L'Oréal is addressing roughly one billion consumers in. 15 years, it will address double. So, what took the company 110 years? To do, they will have to do the same in the next 15 years. So this is really exponential growth. You know, it's uh, again to insist on the, the amount of change that needs to take place. What you see, for example, for a company uh, like L'Oréal or other uh, consumer goods companies, is uh, first you, you are in markets where you have strong local competition. So if I look at the makeup market in Thailand, you have. Uh, uh, Mistine, Giferin, uh, I mean, you have, in the top five, you would have four Thai brands. Before, 
um, and, and uh, number two would be uh, one of the uh, Maybelline, one of the, uh, the brands belonging to, uh, to L'Oreal. So when we launched, for example, because I launched two brands which were more destined to, uh, to the Thai market, affordable Thai market. One was for Garnier, when we launched Garnier in 2002 uh, in Thailand and uh, in the skincare market and one when we launched Maybelline. Uh, and every time you have to rethink, reboot your thinking. You've got to forget what you've learned in Europe, in the US, and you've got to you know, come with new, fresh ideas. Uh, the fresh idea, because everyone looks at the potential, but in fact, you know, if you deploy, if you are too aggressive, then you just simply go bankrupt. I mean, when we launched Garnier, we benchmarked Pons, which was a historical leader in Thailand from Unilever, 30% market share, and uh, you know, 90 baht on the cream. We could not make any money, and we saw that in one, one month, Unilever, Pons, had put as much as one year, our total year advertising budget, for one month. So we were basically you know, uh, dead. So we had to rethink and still come. So the pricing is very important. Then the other thing which is important for a consumer goods company is distribution. You know, go to market strategies is critical. If you talk, for example, at India, um, you know, Unilever goes to two million outlets, roughly, in India. Uh, when we launch, uh, if, you, if you look now in the, in the salon, hair salon, hairdresser market, there is roughly 200,000 salon all over India. L'Oréal Professionnel was in 1,500, the top salon. In order to go and capture the middle class, you know you need another brand. In that case, it was not Garnier, it was Matrix that we used, and we said, okay, let's go to 20,000 salon. What does that mean? You've got to go to cities you've never been before, you've got to identify a sub-distributor, you've got to educate, train staff, you've got to build a showroom, a flagship, so that other hairdressers in the vicinity can come and be trained. So it, it takes a lot of time. And you don't have so much time because, you know, uh, the local comp companies, Dabur, Godrej in India, or Mistine, or, or Smoothie, and so on here, uh, or in China, you have plenty of cosmetic brands uh, uh, which are very successful. Uh, so you have to speed up. So speed is of essence, but timing is also of essence. Just to give another example, which was a bit of a failure, PNG dropped totally their investment in Europe to focus on the emerging market. But still, Europe is an important market. And they, you know, overall, they had a tough year because they went a bit too fast in redeploying the resources. So it's extremely critical, and it's not very easy for a CEO you know, uh, of large multinational company to deploy and reallocate resources drastically. Uh, and the timing is, uh, is, is uh, complicated. Because at first, you know, people could question, you know, why do you put so much effort into a $50 million market, which is you know, quite small. Uh, but in the end, you know that in the long term it will pay off. Uh, ju just uh, to, to illustrate another example, on Maybelline, we saw that, okay, the brand was distributed in top outlets, Watson's, Boots, uh, uh, and uh, Tesco, Big C, and so on, in, in uh, Carrefour in Thailand. And we thought, okay, you know, if we want to one day be successful, we've got to be at MBK, we've got to be uh, in, the, in the more traditional outlets, and uh, upcountry also. So then we uh, started to look at what products were needed. Press powder you know, to cover the sweat because of the humidity of the, the weather is very important here. And the cost to make within our system a press powder was as much as the retail cost, $1. So here it cost $1 to get the press powder. Uh, and that we could not make any money because that was costing as much uh, to just produce it. Uh, then I started to discuss with our team to say, well, I found a very good subcontractor in Thailand uh, called Mylot who can do great stuff, but it's outside of the company. The first reaction from Sir Owen Jones, our CEO, at the time was, you know, Bertrand, yeah, you're stupid, you know, we have factories in uh, China and Indonesia, why do you want to go outside the factories? You know, you need to fill our factories, not the rivers. And I said, yes, uh, dear Mr. Owen Jones, I'm sorry, but, you know, our factories are too expensive. They cannot produce at the right cost. If we want to address this market, we've got to be below 50 cents. Um, so we, in the end, manufactured, through uh, the subcontractor. The company agreed to let us uh, experiment. And now this franchise called Clear Smooth, uh, this franchise accounts for 25% of Maybelline. And Maybelline has grown you know, tenfold between 2000 and uh, 2015. So you know, when I say reboot your engine, is really to, 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 to think really from a total new paradigm. Thank you. Uh, so we're coming to, uh, to an end for this panel, and I'd just like to uh, emphasize a couple of uh, very important points. The first is that uh, 
time is uh, you know, running out. Uh, this trend is reaching a uh, critical levels. And uh, if companies want to succeed and ride the wave of the uh, you know, new uh, global middle class consumer, they need to uh, act now, right? And they need, they need to rethink their strategies. And then the second thing is that uh, the four of us have given you um, uh, quite a few statistics and numbers, and uh, they are all true, correct? Uh, <laughs> however, everything is subject to interpretation, okay? Uh, so please join me in thanking our three panelists for their insights.